if you don't mind, Alfred, let's let's start sort of in media res. Uh, can I take you back to February 35 years ago next month, February uh, 1983? Uh, you were injured in 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 an explosion. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened? First, I would like to express my reservation from bringing you to be my interviewer. I think it's not fair to bring a world expert on disasters, okay, uh, to interview me, unless there is some hidden agenda here, okay, and we are heading, hi. <laughs> um, it's, it's, um, let's go back in time, okay, let's go back in time. Four years ago, we are 82, 83, four years ago, five years ago, Kissinger and Nixon made peace with Vietnam, and somehow America went out of Vietnam, somehow, after, I would say, very interesting, hectic years of the 60s, which were both the years of unexplained war, an unbelievable civil rights uprise and protest movement. I would say the most effective protest movement in the 20th century in American political history. Four years later, Israel invaded Lebanon. I think I know why. Again, travel in time, you started. Okay, yeah. 77, out of nowhere, Deus Ex Machina, President Sadat comes to Israel. I mean, out of nowhere, all of a sudden he knocks on the door. The door was open, here you have a smiling Egyptian, the warmest smile in the Well, well that was journalism, yeah, right there. Yeah, I mean, that was a journalism started peace effort. It, it, it was an interview from, I believe, Barbara Walters, with yeah, yeah. Sadat asking if he would meet with and Menachem he said, Begin, yes, and will. he said yes. Yeah, and he came with the warmest smile in the Middle East that actually thought the entire Israeli frozen attitude, and with a smile got back the entire penin Sinai Peninsula. Was most of, one of the most rewarding smiles ever <laughs> smiled by any, any, any person. So in 77 started the process that he came that ended up in April and 82, Israel completely withdrew in a quite a dramatic, traumatic withdrawal from the entire Sinan Peninsula, all of its very wealthy oil wells, Jewish settlements over there, unbelievable, beautiful beaches along the Red Sea, Sinai Desert and its beauties, that was April 82. It was too much for Menachem Begin and Ariel Sharon. Oh, wait, 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 before and we get there. two months that. later, they invaded Lebanon in order to compensate their psyche. But before then, okay. you know, let's just, in this time period, now this is 30, 40 years ago now, 78 is 40 years ago. Um, I w you were obviously in Israel. I was uh, in Columbus, Ohio, in a very, uh, a Jewish family that grew up Zionist. Um, my um, Golda Meir would stay at my grandmother, grandparents' house when she would visit in Boston. This shows the you the woman who made Milwaukee famous. <laughs> yeah, okay. And <laughs> I remember that when this happened, there was such among the American Jewish community, there was such an optimism. There is. There was comic. I, mean, I remember there were t talk of almost a joint. Israel, Egypt, one country between the two. That want, was obviously the I Americans was, getting things still, wrong. I still, I still want to stick to your initial yeah. question. So Israel invaded Lebanon because if you ask me psychological problems or psy pol psychopolitics rather than real politics, it was unnecessary war with fully, uh, uh, fully reasoning. Just remember, George W. Bush goes to the Senate, to the Congress, and to the UN, and persuades them in a deceiving way 
why is it okay to invade uh, Iraq since Saudis put down the Twin Towers? The same reasoning was for Ariel Sharon invading Lebanon in 82. And right after, the first time in the history of the war, we three people, two friends of mine and myself, established the first ever protest movement by soldiers against the war in Lebanon. I was just an anonymous student for industrial design in Israel, and all of a sudden, in two and a half minutes, I became under the lights of the most, the, the central stage of Israeli politics, not because I'm so talented, which I am, and not because I'm so modest, which I'm not, and uh, uh, simply because of the reason that I protested against the cabinet that decided to go to the war, and my father was well, a member of the cabinet. I was and, gonna say that. And that's as a gimmick, <laughs> people find it interesting, let's put it like this, okay? <laughs> And, um, and we protested, and a couple of months later, in Rosh Hashanah, the new Jewish New Year of 83, Christian militias in Lebanon, under, I will say, the, con the, 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 the influence zone or the military zone of the Israeli Defense Forces, Christian militias slaughtered Palestinian refugees in Sabrain Shatila refugee camps. So we went out and protested against our indirect by proxy responsibility to whatever happened in our influence zone or, or military zone. Was bitter in the streets, was violent in the streets, took us a couple of months, and then there was an inquiry commission, and we went again demanding that the government will adopt the inquiry commission uh, uh, recommendations, which was not very simple. And by the end of this demonstration, a hand grenade was thrown on us in the rally. A good friend of mine, Democratic activist Emil Greenswijk, was killed on the spot. Few people were injured, me among them. And that was, I would say, the first modern time political assassination in Israel, which was in a way the prelude or the introduction for a 10 years later assassination of Yitzhak Rabin with the same rhetorics, with the same incitement, and coming from the, sa the same side of the political street. And just to explain why we start there. I have no clue. <laughs> I mean. Oh, you, but in many ways, it's so much ingrained in your writing. So much of uh, what goes on now, and, and in, especially in, in Jewish culture, is very historical oriented. And you can't understand the present without understanding uh, the key events of the past, which when this, this is one of the key events of, uh, of, of your history and Israel's history. Um, it is, is, as you said, it's the first assassination. Um, and as an example, and you have written a, a, a book here about it, is, uh, the Jewish people from Israel and outside of Israel always taught uh, yeah, the Holocaust is ingrained in, in, in the Jewish culture. And you have written that it may be ingrained in not the best of ways, or it may not be used in the best of ways. Um, so first, let's talk. How, how do you see the Holocaust as part of what Israel is now, and and Jews in general are now? I don't like the Holocaust. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I a decade ago I wrote a book that in Hebrew was called Lenatzeach et Hitler, Defeating Hitler. But since American publishers do not really trust American readers, so first they have to rewrite everything, then they have to chew the food, then to have to recycle it, <laughs> then to have, they have to soften it, then they have to water it down, then they give it to you. So they said, listen, listen, the title of Defeating Hitler is too strong. Let's give something which is more 
Mm, not mellow, but marshmallow. The Holocaust is over, let's rise from its ashes. And the cover is a beautiful flower, yes. uh, whatever. And, and this is actually the gist of my argument. I wrote a book which, exp my first book at the very early 20, uh, 2000s, I wrote a book named uh, God is Back. Don't worry, it's not an autobiography. It is something else, okay? <laughs> in which, uh, in which I, 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 I try to understand how comes that by the end of the 20th century, which was the most secular man-made century, all the isms, fascism, Nazism, nationalism, capitalism, socialism, Zionism, all of these ideologies that try to redesign the, 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 the human landscape and to bring about kind of uh, human-made, messianic, redemptive uh, salvation to humanity, all of them failed. And by the end of the most secular century ever, the only one left standing was God. Entering the 21st century is actually, I would say, the only star but Donald Trump. I mean, I didn't understand how, how, how comes. So I wrote a book trying to analyze the returning of religion in the, our political equations, both Israelis and abroad. And my basic, always my basic reading of reality is that Israel is the microcosm of the West, the same way the West is the macrocosm of Israel. You want to understand the detail, go over there. You want to understand the picture, go over there. But there is that kind of uh, um, microscope, telescope relations between the two of them. Both are about optics, but it, you see it differently. So I wrote this book, and then something awful happened to me. And if any one of you has in mind to write a book, I can give you one recommendation only. Only. And I published after, since I left the Knesset um, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, I published five books. The last one was published here in America this week. So it not only did I have birthday this week, and not only I had fantastic uh, 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 J term with my students, and not only I published a book here, I have a new grandson born this week. So I had a fantastic week, okay? So I wrote a book, and uh, my recommendation to you is if you write a book, do me a favor, don't read it after you publish it. <laughs> I read my book, and I said, Gewald, <laughs> Oy vey, I described one pillar which supports the structure or the roof of the Israeli being, which is church and state relations, and I completely forgot and ignore and omitted the Holocaust, which is an Israeli religion. We have establishments, we have high priests, we have rituals, we have rites, we have holidays, we, it's, it's a sacred issue. How did I forget it? How comes? It comes because as much as both Ima and Abba, my, fa my dad and my mom, came from a very personal traumatic background. Dad ran away from Berlin in, in September 39, the very, 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 very last moment. And mom is a, is a, is a, was saved by a local Palestinian in the 29 massacre massacre, and both their family were to completely destroyed and demolished, they were good people, happy people, full of warmth, and we never grew up in, we, we grew up in a trauma-free environment. So when you grow up in a trauma-free environment, the Holocaust is an event, is an issue, it's a memory, it happened, but it is not the molder. So I forgot about it. So I said, listen, our room, you cannot leave it like that. Let's write another book. So I wrote another book, and f when you write a book, you do your research. And for two or three years, I collected, I collected everything I could find about contemporary expressions of the Holocaust of the Shoah. And I discovered that there is not even one day in Israel in which the Holocaust is not mentioned in my beloved Haaretz, left-wing, liberal, secular newspaper. 
Sometimes it's a political expression. Sometimes it's uh, some atrocity somewhere. Sometimes it's an anti-Semite expression. Sometimes it's an art uh, exhibition somewhere. Not even a day passes without it. And I started writing about it, and I discovered, so stupid, I mean, it's out in the open, but I mean, it's obvious uh, 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 to sh uh, Sherlock. Um, I discovered that the Holocaust in Israel is the national strategy. We have a strategy of trauma rather than a strategy of trust. I can explain it. I can understand it. I have some sympathy for it. I think it's wrong. So much wrong, it is not that I say, don't remember. It is not that I say, don't learn from the lesson. I say, don't exploit it. Don't be cynical. Don't use it as a political tool to launder everything which should not be laundered. And there is a Holocaust wash strategy in Israel, used by political leaders and used by Amcha, by the local people. Here we are, three years ago, at the last round between Israel and Gaza. Many Israelis are for this because there are misas and this and that, and a room like a good pinko, left wing, peacenik, communist, well, well poisoned and no goodnik, goes to protest against the war. So here I am in Tel Aviv with five more people against the rest of the world, and everybody's shouting, and it's a beautiful, tranquil, typical Tel Aviv in the middle of the war demonstration. Okay. I walk back to my car, some, a group of, of right-wing thugs corner me. Sh recognize my face, shouting, shouting, shouting. After a while, the energy went down. They said, one of them said, Everyone would like to talk to you. I said, I, I, I thought this is what you tried to do for half an hour now by shouting <laughs> at me, OK? He said, no, 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 seriously. I said, OK, seriously. So he said, I understand that you don't like the war in Gaza. But tell me the truth. Do we operate gas chambers in Gaza? I said, no. So he said, so it's kosher. When you compare every problem to the absolute atrocity, all of a sudden, it is so bright and white and longer and shining. And this is a cynical use. So that was my book. The day it was published, overnight, set overnight, I was elected third, and I was very popular. And if I can use a Yiddish term, I was the mamele of the nation. I was the, 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 I was the, the, the sweetheart of the political system. They loved me, and I loved them loving me. <laughs> Overnight, I became the most popular pariah in Israel. Here I am, a day or two after the book was published. Headlines are all over the place. On the line, I think it was the bank. I'm not sure. I think it's on the bank. Standing there, innocently waiting. A guy turns to me. I don't know him. And he said, Boog. I said, yes. I'm very angry at you. I said, what did I do? He said, you wrote against the Holocaust. And I said, and you, would you have written for the Holocaust? <laughs> and the argument is still valid. I think my prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, took the Holocaust exploitation to levels never before. So much so that I'm afraid that the day is coming that people in the world, especially in Germany, will say, Israelis, there is an overdraft in your account. You drew so much out of this Holocaust account. And then one, and last but not least, a day will come in our lifetime that the last Holocaust survivor and the last Nazi victimizer will pass away. A couple more years. If, if that, I was going to say. I'm sorry? If that, given it, it's, 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 it's a, probably within a couple, you know, yeah, maybe in, a in year. In our lifetime. Yeah. And then one day we should wake up in the morning, and in our realm, the Holocaust will not be anymore a living memory, a living experience. It will become a memory. And the real struggle is about the strategy 
of the memory. My teacher and mentor, Professor Yuda Elkanah, who was a Holocaust survivor from Auschwitz as a kid, came out of the, came out of the place and said two kinds of people came out of Auschwitz. The majority of Jews and Israelis and say, who say, never again to us Jews. And therefore, let's have the most fortified possible safe haven, shelter, as many possible denied bombs, as many possible German submarines for third and, and fifth strikes and whatever it is. And some who came out and said, never again to any human. Because the Holocaust was done by human beings to human beings. And we are committed to prevent it wherever it happens and to protest against any kind of atrocity whenever it's being exercised against any human being. I belong to this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, Holocaust disciples and students rather than to the former. And in terms, uh, as you said, this was not well received in Israel. Um, I believe you even suggested that many of the institutions that have been you know, not just erected, but established, you know, days like, you know, Yad Vashem, and that they sh those should be ended, right? And uh, not so much so, but when they came after me, I came after them. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's put it like this. In the world, there are many, many Holocaust museums. There are three basic themes. Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, which is a very important museum, research center, educational and pedagogical laboratory. But basically, it's a generator which generates day in and day out the right of existence of the state of Israel. I do not, I personally do not believe that the Holocaust is the justifier for the state of Israel. The Holocaust is the Holocaust, and the state of Israel is the state of Israel. Yes, 45, 48, it's, it's one year only. It's a one year of 900 days or whatever it is, but it's, it's the same period. But I, don't, I think that the Jewish people, like any other people, Palestinians included, have, has the right for self-determination. And I, if the Jewish people decides we want to define ourselves this way or that way, that's fine. You don't have to kill me in order to persuade me. But would Israel... Second, oh, yeah, okay. The second museum is the Jewish Museum in Berlin. An amazing phenomena. Very interesting in approach, both the architecture of Danny Liebeskind and the content. And the argument there is Jews and Germany, it's a thousand years of romantic relations, very fruitful, with awful couple of years. But the Holocaust is not the entire story. The Holocaust is terrible, shouldn't happen, and see what happens in Germany nowadays, how it is the champion of refugees, sensitive to refugees, sensitive to miseries, etc., etc. And the other things also at the relationship between Jews and Germany. And the Holocaust Museum over here, that the first exhibition, the first portrait that meets you is the Armenian Holocaust. And when you walk out, it's the Syrian reality today. So three different expressions, educational expressions, how to commemorate this horrific atrocity. I belong to the, to the, to the Washingtonian School of Thought. Okay, before, one I'm last sorry. thing, and then let's, leave, let's move from the Holocaust to mod, more modern time, um, current times. But you talk about how it's so ingrained. Would Israel exist? without the Holocaust. Can that explain? Would, would Israel have been created? Would the rest of the world um, recognize Israel in 1948 uh, without the Holocaust? Because you had thousands you know, of years of attempts to, for a Jewish homeland there. And it was only after the Holocaust that it came to be. Here are two Jewish gentlemen walking towards each other in the streets of Tel Aviv. 
and one is holding two gigantic um, uh, watermelons under his armpits. And the other one is asking him, excuse me, do you know where is Bialik Street? So he said, would you hold the watermelons for a second? So he takes the watermelon and he says, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I mean, <laughs> what do I know? I mean, the fact that the gates of the camps were open and the UN resolution was passed and the State of Israel was established and the Zionist preparation of 50 years earlier, prior to it, even prior to the Holocaust, were good enough in order to ensure that the UN resolution will be eventually become a sustainable reality, it happened. What do I know? Would it happen? Would it? I have no clue. But I will ask you, would Jordan be established without the decolonization of the Middle East after the, set, uh, the First and the Second World War. I have no clue. Iraq, Saudi Arabia, yep. modern Syria. I have no clue. The whole Middle East is a kind of uh, a little bit of artificial, uh, artificial uh, 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 map drawing. Sykes, Picot, etc. Okay. I can ask you another question. Would Iraq collapse if George W. Bush would not have decided to introduce democracy? into this region this way? I don't know. Don't ask me historical questions. I mean, ask me, but don't expect to give you a good one. I will say as follows. If you ask me, you know, theoretically speaking, what do you prefer? What do you prefer? A Jewish people without the Holocaust and without the State of Israel, or a Jewish, or Jewish people with the Holocaust and the State of Israel, I say, take back the state and give me back the six million. Okay. Now let's move to now, because you are you now have a French passport in addition. Do you right? What is? Well, you could probably um, filibuster the the rest of the time here if I ask you just what is wrong with the state of Israel at the moment. Uh, Nothing. It's a perfect place, but needs some improvements. <laughs> okay, I mean, <laughs> how, given you know, our disc where we are now in terms of the politics of Israel, it has been, I believe, you've, you've used the term fascist at some times, have you not? Will you take the watermelons for a second? Okay. <laughs> uh, the, simple, the simple answer is we are more or less where all of you are. Okay, we are more or less where America is. We are more or less where other populist uh, regimes yeah. are happening. Brexit and uh, uh, Wilders, Brexit in Great Britain, Wilders in Netherlands. Uh, you were there first. In Italy. You've been there longer. We are more experienced, I mean, okay, but uh, <laughs> otherwise, uh, but I'm not at all sure this is the issue. Not at all sure this is the issue. <clears throat> as much as Israel is facing in a more condensed, because the echo box is smaller than between the two coasts here, okay, so therefore the echoes are a little bit more noisy, uh, we are facing the same issues uh, um, of weakening liberal democracies in the world in general. And there are issues with the collapse of the, the erosion of the nation state. There is an erosion of the nation state in the West because it is one time it is being, the, 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 the state as a structure is, is being drinked by the globalization, multinationals, etc. I mean, will it be the European Union which is stronger and therefore sucks up uh, some of the authorities of the, of the sub-states, or be it the, the, the 27, 28 states of the European Union? Will it be the uh, Canadian, American, Mexican agreement with any other regional, be it I'm a citizen of Google, which means I work for Google Center in Tel Aviv, 
but Google pays taxes somewhere else, if at all, okay, <laughs> and therefore my labor benefits some other society, et cetera, et cetera. So the globalization empties some of the world of the state upstairs, and then micro powers weaken it from downstairs, be it civil society, identity politics, NGOs, militias, uh, uh, white supremacy, arguments, nationalism, tribalism, ethnicism, you name it. So the classical nation state in the West is being attacked from b above and from below. So Israel suffers the same, st the same issues. At the same time, we have some private 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 uh, problems okay and i will state um i will state with your permission two or three of them okay the first is overarching is the occupation we love and i'm a one who said it so many times when i was in office israel is the only democracy in the middle east you know what it sounds good i'll say it again Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. But since there are some cracks in the utopia, I will be a little bit more moderate and I will say, well, Israel is the only half democracy in the Middle East. In the sense that it, it is completely not democratic to the occupied Palestinians, Israel has an absolute control, an absolute monopoly over rights and resources and power and politics and identity and access to the entire space between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. But only 50% of the population, Jews, are privileged to enjoy this monopoly. So we talk about one state with two regimes. So much so that 40% of the population between the Jordan and the Mediterranean do not have a political right to shape, to decide, or to influence who will be the politicians who influence their life. And that's the essence of democracy. I vote for you, and if you do, you're not good, I replace you because you decide on my life. But if I'm somebody in Nablus, or in Ramallah, or in Jericho, I cannot vote for Netanyahu, who actually impacts my life. So that's the first problem with the democracy. The second problem with democracy is of room. I'm in love. I love you, Seth. I want to propose to you. I mean, we're two minutes here. <laughs> there is an Israel. I don't know if there is in the world a, a TV show like this, which is uh, instant weddings. I mean, they bring a couple. You have it. They bring a couple. They never met each other, and they marry, and then let's see. So I want to I propose. You are a Jew. This is what you said. I mean, I never checked before, but I heard it earlier. OK. <laughs> so I propose, but we cannot marry, because there is no same-sex uh, 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 marriage in Israel. But even if there was same-sex marriage in Israel, I can marry you the orthodox way only, providing there is an orthodox Jewish way to marry a man. Okay? Because even if I were, a, even if I were a reformed Jew. If, if there is no way. Yeah. So it is a democracy when my personal status is decided by one notion of religion only. You know, and this is fantastic. I'll open brackets for a second. For 2,000 years, we were in the diaspora, were spread around the world. And if there is one thing we did not have, we did have a Catholic church structure. We didn't have a pope. Thank God, because of the Holocaust, because of Ben-Gurion, because of whomever, we have the state of Israel. And now, not only we have one pope, we have two popes, the Ashkenazi one and the Sephardi one. Okay, we have two chef rabbis, and they are the only one who can decide over my life. I cannot marry same sex. I cannot marry a non-Jew. Which I did, by the way. I'm sorry? Which I did, by the way. I, we can talk about it later, okay? I mean, I'm not at all sure, I'm not at all sure this is the program, but, no. um, uh, but all of a sudden, it's not a full, uh, it's not a full democracy. And, and you know, marriage is, by the, by the end of the day, the basic right of each and every individual yes. to establish my, their nests. Let me interrupt for one second. How is this different than Iran? Than Iran? Oh, they're the merry Iranians. We, 
I don't know, I've never been the last year I registered for the Iran Marathon, for the first Tehran Marathon. And at the regist at registration, there is a note. I said, please pay attention that I'm an Israeli. I have a French passport, but I'm an Israeli, and I'm the former speaker of the house. So I'd like you to pay attention. I don't want to embarrass you. For more than a year, we had a negotiation, me and the uh, Olympic, uh, uh, Olympic uh, Committee or whatever, will I be able to participate or not? I have no clue what's going on in Iran, but I, I, I'll define it, in, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you in a second. So what I do in the last couple of years, since the marriage of, of my daughter Ronin to 2008, I told my kids, listen kids, if you marry in the chief rabbinate, I'm not coming. <laughs> it's not the business of the chief rabbi to decide your sex life, okay? I'm not coming. Of course I would have come, okay? <laughs> so they asked me to marry them. I married three of my kids at home in a very beautiful, egalitarian, yet Jewish wedding. And ever since, I have, in the last eight, 10 years, I have something like 200 to 300 requests a year to marry couples. I marry some 60, mainly those who cannot find any other solutions, Jews and non-Jews, same sex, or uh, any other, uh, and many other problems. According to the Israeli law, they can exercise it on me overnight. I can go to jail for two years for this. Okay? Which might be interesting, by the way. It may produce a book or two. Okay? <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but nonetheless, I say this is something you don't have in America, you don't have in Europe, you don't have in so many other places. And I can go on and on. So what I say is I think that in Israel... There are two, it's a promising democracy against all hopes with two built-in problems. I say them. Why it's a democracy against all hopes? In political science, there is a model which says that immigrants who immigrated from liberal countries established liberal entities. Immigrants from Great Britain or the United Kingdom at the time established New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and the United States of America, if you still can call it a democracy. Um, immigrants who immigrated from the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, established all of these non-very democratic banana republics of Latin America. When you look at Israel, the overwhelming majority of Israelis are coming from a non-democratic background. 50% of us are coming from the Muslim hemisphere. 25 to 30% are coming from the Russian uh, uh, Soviet experience. Hundreds of thousands of Holocaust survivors. Couple of people, uh, a couple of hundreds of thousands from Latin America. And Benjamin Netanyahu from North America. So it's not enough. So it's a, it's a democracy against all hope, still functions. The game is played in town. We have two built-in problems, church and state, and Jewish, non-Jewish. So far, it's an ethnical democracy, and ethnical democracy is quite a limited one. It's a, it's a, it's a paralyzed democracy. That's a, it is a democracy, but not yet perfect. Is that the United States' future? I don't know. You have... Here, what we do not have, you have a constitutional wall of separation between church and state. It is right that the wall is a little bit lower recently and the people are a little bit taller recently. So I don't know how the separation works anymore, okay? I see the educational system, I see the political system, I see some precedents by local and, and federal courts decisions, I don't know. I don't even understand what does that mean that on your dollar bill you're having God we trust. I just imagine that the ultra-Orthodox in Israel who are anyway playing with our money, okay, uh, will, will ask to have a, a, a shekel bill within God we trust. I don't know what does that mean. I don't know what does that mean that the president ends each and every his uh, 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 State of the Union address by God bless America. I don't know what does that mean. I have no clue, okay? I don't know if there is a real separation between church and state, is there an erosion here, but at least you have a constitutional infrastructure. Since we do not have a constitution, everything is open for political bargain. And the society, like so many other societies like ours around the world, 
is less secular and more traditional and religious, less democratic and more ethnical and nationalistic, and therefore the religious dimension becomes more and more dominant. Where America goes is an interesting question because I was amazed and so happy that the only secular candidate in the 2016 e elections was the Jew. Okay, I admire Bernie Sanders. I never yes. met him, but he enriched the, 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 the conversation and the discourse. You don't have to agree with him to say, hmm, that was a very interesting input. Okay, so, and I see, I see the pendulum coming back. Coming back, which, wait, coming back left, or are we still sh shrinking, uh, careening right? And it, let's, both Israel and the U.S. I mean, can not Israel it, go any further right? Well, sure. Come on. We only just started. We're a young nation. <laughs> it's only 50 years of occupation. What do you want, okay? Israel and America are not the same story as much yeah. as we want to believe that we have shared value language and we, we are both having, I'm sorry I'm using the term because my English is so limited, we, say, we both have the same manifest destiny. Okay, yeah. is it relevant today, the manifest destiny? Uh, better than the previous re the, the presidency, right? It's all of a sudden back to business. I think that what happens to America, <laughs> is fascinating. And <clears throat> I'll give you two, two taking. I'm an outsider. I'm a self-appointed intellectual de la schmate. Okay, what do I know? I mean, I just read, I just listen, I just interview people. And as I tell my students, and I love gossip. So through gossips, I try to, to take the deed to pixels and to see the photo, okay? Back to the 20th century. Most of the 20th century ideologies ended up in a very grotesque way. Nazism, Hitler as malicious as he was, was grotesque. Mussolini, as well. When you look at the end of communism, Yeltsin, or the last couple of years, it ended up, I would say, ridiculing the whole, I mean, it was ridiculous by the end of the, it was almost funny, Yeltsin, this Yeltsin guy. The only uh, worldwide ideology and, and movement that we believed won was capitalism. When the wall came down in Berlin by the end of the 80s, Fukuyama said that's the end of history. I mean, that's it, capitalism won. Democapitalism won, and that's the end of it. But it didn't win, it simply was the last one standing. And my feeling is that Donald Trump is the grotesque ending of the 20th century malicious capitalism the way we knew it. And when we go down 10, 15 years down the road, capitalism will look differently, secularism will look differently, conservatism will look differently. Item number one about America. Item number two about America, <clears throat> which is quite global. Is there, at the past, theoretically speaking, Political systems had two kind, two families of parties. The party of property, royalist, bourgeois, capitalist, people who have had property and had to defend it in the parliament, and the political system, whatever, they had vested interest. And the parties of people, communist, socialist, whatever it is. Most of democratic parties around the West today are not parties of people anymore. When you listen very carefully to the criticism of both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders against Hillary Clinton, it's Wall Street. You Democrat, you're Wall Street. You took the democratic uh, 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 narrative and made it the party of the money 
and the property rather than the party of the people. Came Donald Trump, and from the right side, spoke with the people. He okay. said, I speak your language as much as I'm them, I'm you. And nobody on the left side said, as much as I'm you, I speak you. So will somebody stand up at the left side and reorganize people and people's interests and people's fears and people's needs in a way which is more responsible for the collective good? That's the challenge of the liberal camp. Because a dialectic process happened, and I'm sorry it's in academia, so I'll be abstract for a second, okay? okay. Usually, the right is about freedoms. I have the freedom, the liberty to be different. So much different that I can have some privileges and protect my, my privileges. The left was supposed to be about equality and equal chance and equal opportunities and, 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 and working very hard that the gap between have and have not will not grow too, too much then we sh that, so too much that we should lose the, the social solidarity. But then during the 90s, 80s and 90s, the left fell in love with the politics of identity. So I have the privilege and affirmative action of the circumcised people and the transparent people, and the tall people, and the short people, and the girls, and the boys, and the high, and the this. And all of a the sudden, this, the left is in love with differences, and adopting the right-wing philosophy that I'm at liberty to be different, and therefore, the left-wing libertarian politics of identity smashed the responsibility for collective good, and the left became right. And nobody at the side of the left stands up and say, this is my vision for the nation. The same is right in Great Britain, and in France, and in Germany, and in Israel, and here. So when I say the pendulum will come back, it might be a right winger who will stand up and say, I have a vision for the collective good. Imagine that John McCain is now 30 years younger. Is he a decent Democrat uh, candidate? Ooh, compared to what we have now in, uh, in Washington, not bad. Not bad, not bad, even compared to, I mean, naturally, he's a, I mean, he took so many beautiful positions. And I can go on and on and on and on. Imagine that Oprah is a conservative candidate. She didn't say where she belongs, but she will come with a kind of, kind of a vision which says, listen, my ID is on my skin, but I'm not about my subgroup. I'm about us. I'm about us. What I say is there will be new definitions of who is right and who is left, what is liberal and what is conservative. And the redefined political arena will produce um, a correction to the populist movement. It will be responsible populist movement. Sorry for the length of the lecture. It was the short version. <laughs> now if we can get back closer to um, probably what many of you came here to talk about, let's talk about sort of where Paul, the um, Israeli-U.S. relationship, uh, the U.S., the Israeli-Arab uh, relationship, um, and peace. First, is it, it is, do you see any way that peace can come out of where we are right now in Israel? Can you tell me any conflict in history that was not eventually either dissolved or resolved? Give me one. We're still in the middle of several. We don't know if they ever end. We'll come to the Sunni-Shia conflict in the Middle East okay. in a second, okay? But so many conflicts that at the time, nobody could imagine that the Ireland, Protestants and Catholics, forget about Ireland, I mean, Europe, Everybody killed everybody else, and then some. But there's ending 
with peace and that is ending with conquest. But there is an ending. Okay? It, there it's is a an big end. difference if you're, if you're the conquested uh, group. I don't disagree. I don't disagree. It's just, it's just to say that even the worst of the conflicts has an expiration date. Okay. We don't know when is it, but it is somewhere there. So I would like to address it uh, from the following way. I think that I hate to admit it, but if I have to be honest to my uh, intellectual, um, my intellectual integrity, I think that the two-state solution expired. Why? Okay, it's beautiful to talk about it. It sounds good. It gives everybody a feeling. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, it, it is not there anymore. And one of the responsibles are people like me. I, for 40 years, I was part of the peace industry. I enjoyed tremendously. I traveled around the world. I was welcome to uh, um, uh, think tanks and panels. And, ooh, I went places. Peace is profitable. Ooh. Peace is an industry. Listen, it's, it's, it's a good business. Okay, not as profitable as the war business, but it's not bad. I mean, you can make a living. <clears throat> and I travel around the world for not 50 years, but for 35 or 40 years now. And I always gave the impression that the solution is around the corner. You know, I grew up in a movement called Peace Now. Which means, I mean, five minutes, we finished this Nujerai here, this uh, nagging uh, event, and I make peace out of, I mean, on the street, on the way to the Dunkin' Donuts, I cut the deal, I mean, it's around the corner. Clinton is coming, Clinton is going, Obama doctrine, Clinton, I mean, oh, everything is around the corner. So we always had the feeling that next week it's, uh, it's over. And at the same time that people like me bought time to say it's very transitional, it's very temporary, it is, it is about to be resolved, the other side created enough facts on the ground. Settlements, de facto annexation, military presence, national psyche, which is so important, a generation after generation, that today to think that it is possible, today, to withdraw from all of these 50 years of massive investment of Israel in the occupied territories is childish. So my dilemma now is not to persuade people that the two-state solution is around the corner. And, I, and I'm really sorry for my Palestinian friends who, who, who are mad at me or say, Avram, you can be a post-state because for 70 years you have it. Give us five, year, five minutes of a Palestinian state, then we give it up. And you give it, us, give it up on our behalf before we even had it. I say I apologize, I simply don't see it. Because my argument as an Israeli now is that it is not between two states beautiful formula and one state threatening formula. I think that the fight today is between the current state of affairs, which is between the Jordan and the Mediterranean, there is a one state, the state of Israel, and two different regimes, full of privileges to the Jews, Israelis, and quite a little bit less, privile uh, less, less privileges to the Palestinians, or, as difficult as it is, to start a process that eventually, maybe even 50 years' time, there will be one state with one regime that every individual between the Jordan and the Mediterranean will have the rights for the same rights. Now, the problem with that, according to the right wing in, in Israel, is they look at the demographics. No, no, no. There is no problem. No problem at all. The right wingers in Israel, they agree with me. They say they were so much against the unilateral withdrawal from Gaza. Ask the most radical right winger, do you want to go back to Gaza? Never in their lifetime. Not because they don't like the, the, the Gaza but because it immediately removed a million or two million people out of the equation, left us with only two and a half million in the West Bank. So, okay, so we can have a one-state right-wing uh, uh, thinking, and the demography will never catch up with us. Never? This is what they have in mind. Okay. 
why do you think the Israeli right wingers are so much against the reconciliation between Gaza and the West Bank, between Hamas and Fatah? Not because they are so happy that about the renewed brotherhood. It is because the minute there is uh, a reconciliation, two million people from Gaza are back to the equation. That's the issue. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, um, the only caveat or the only reservation to my uh, 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 my, my statement that, that, they, that, that it expired is as follows. Israel, like so many other societies, reacts very well to traumas. The 73 war brought the peace with Egypt. The first war in the Gulf brought Madrid conference. The first intifada brought Oslo. If there will be a serious Tra trauma for the Israelis, and I do not know of what nature. It might be a simple removal. Donald Trump will lose it and remove the, the, the UN uh, veto, uh, sa safety, veto safety net that America is permanently giving us. Will it be international sanctions? Will it be a mega terror activity? Will it be another political assassination in Israel? I don't know what. Okay. Will it be uh, uh, a remove, I mean, a, a Jewish bomb at the Temple Mount, at the mosques, and there were a couple of attempts already done by Jewish extremists and zealots to try to remove it. Five or six attempts already. If something like this or something else like this will happen, Israelis will listen differently. As for now, Israelis do not see, do not feel, do not hear and do not care about the occupied territories. It became a transparent non-issue in the Israeli political uh, uh, um, arena. The love affair between Donald Trump and Bibi Netanyahu, um, where does that this go? Is, this is the, the, sh the, the, sh the sh how do you say it? What Donald Trump paid, lawyer, uh, uh, attorney paid this girl, what is uh, sh Hush money. Hush money. Yeah, well, um, there was some hush money given between the two of them that they're very hush about some of the, these love affairs, okay? But nonetheless, okay, go on. The American right, you know, the evangelical Christian community. The base. I'm sorry, oh. the base. Yes. Yeah. They, they seem more Zion, Zionistic than sort of my parents' generation. Um, and it, this is a fairly recent thing. Um, what is, can you explain the politics of the American right-wing love affair and what happens with an, a US embassy in Jerusalem? Can you explain to me what happened with the U.S. Embassy in London <laughs> and who built it? Um, George W. Bush. Oh, really? Oh, really? But it was inaugurated. <laughs> no, anyway, <laughs> what do I know about American politics? Um, you lived it just a few years ahead of time. <laughs> um, <coughs> it's two different questions. The love affair is a very interesting one. All during the years, because of various reasons, emotional, symbolic, ideological, biblical, Protestant, there is a very deep Protestant pro proximity between Protestant thinking interpretation of the Bible and the Zionist interpretation of the Bible. So the state of Israel became very dear to the American strategy, paradigm. Oh, I hate that word. Yeah, but it, the dogma. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. It sounds more. That is better. Yeah, more, more European. Okay. Yeah, it's also um, just more paradigm. Yeah, it's okay. just not a real word. Okay, dogma. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, that's the journalism teacher in me. If I see that in I'm your, sorry for the you know. shortage of words in my English. <laughs> no, no, I mean, no. My no, vocabulary it's... is a bit limited. Um, Trust me, it isn't. I've been <laughs> listening. Um, it was there. And therefore, Israel 
symbolically and emotionally was a bipartisan issue. Logical, not logical, made sense, did not make sense, irrelevant, it, it was it. During the last decade, there is an erosion, and we shall end up the conservative era in Israel in a situation in which Israel is a partisan issue. The support, active support, that the Israeli Prime Minister gave to Mitt Romney during the campaign, the open battle of the Israeli Prime Minister against the sitting President Barack Obama, going with the conservatives here behind the back to the front yard of the White House to the hill against the policy, etc., etc., made is put Israel on the trail, on the track towards being a partisan issue. Good, bad, <coughs> I do not know. I do not know. So, you, Obama didn't rise to the bait. He you knew he didn't. He just let it go. You know, I can't imagine had this been Donald Trump and against Donald Trump, what would have happened? <laughs> what would have happened had Obama said, Are "You going to be like that?" You know, to hell with this. Obama did it at the last, at the transition between the elections and the inauguration. He removed the veto. Uh, at the U uh, at the UN, a little late. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, Obama, Obama in the Middle East. I think Obama was a great president. Um, looks like an amazing human being. A little bit too professorial, but we're at the university, so it's okay. Um, um, his Middle East policy. The jury is the jury is still out. The Cairo the Cairo speech. I don't know what it means, the betrayal of the elections. The, there are issues there. Israel is not the only yeah. question mark vis-a-vis -vis Obama's Middle East policy. And could you say Syria, hap you know, Syria is somewhat I, I of an say, outgrowth? I, I, seriously speaking, yeah. I need time to see whether his paradigm worked because Removing the chemical, the chemical weapons from uh, most of them from Syria is an achievement. I think that the agreement with Iran is an arch achievement of diplomacy over shooting first and then talking, talking later. I mean, but we need time to see how it goes. So I don't know what Obama would have had. However, the first strategic erosion is Israel is becoming a partisan issue. And, and Jerusalem? I, as an embassy? So this is item yeah. number one. When you listen even to the, con to the Democratic Convention a year and a half ago, we were watered down there. And at the, at the time, it was the Democrats who were our sponsors, so to say. Issue number one, is it an achievement? Is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. It is there. The second is the embassy in Jerusalem. In a good day, I will say I don't really understand it. On an average day, I will say, it is so stupid, Mr. President. <laughs> it is so stupid. It is so shallow. It is so not serious. I know what he had in mind. I read Steve Bannon saying, uh, saying, ah, we have a solution. We have a formula. The Egyptians will take Gaza. The Jordanian will take the West Bank. So we have a solution. This is what he said just before the inauguration. He said in the, this what was just published recently by Wolf. And then I, I'm sure that the president says, ah, Jerusalem, everybody said that's the most difficult issue. I removed it from the table. I'm sure that President Trump is completely persuaded that he solved the issue of Jerusalem. I have no doubt about it. Embassy or no embassy, <clears throat> It's symbolic. Jerusalem is the nuclear reactor. It can explode the whole thing. It's so iconic, it can become an iconic solution. So what do you want to do with that? You want to move, you president, you want to move Jerusalem first, though all the experts all during the years said, leave it for lost. 
and when after, re after we reconcile all the rest of the issues, territory, borders, power, resources, refugees, we come back carefully to this overloaded by too many gods city of peace. Okay? You want to put it first on the table? No problem. But you want to bring both sides to the table, right? Don't you? So say something like, I recognize West Jerusalem as the capital of, Jeru of Israel. And once I will finish the whole deal of mine, and there will be a state of Palestine, East Jerusalem will be the Palestinian capital of it. Wow, that's a formula. Not exactly details. We don't know which street belongs to whom and this and that. But at least you gave something to both sides. The way he did it, he lost the Palestinians. Did he really ever have the Palestinians? It's difficult for the Palestinians. Listen, America is bad news. All of you are bad news, people. Okay, I'm a Palestinian now. I'm in Ramallah. I'm in Nablus. I'm in Jericho. And I understand <coughs> that America is the croupier. How do you say croupier in English? I think you just did. Like in the Atlantic? The croupier, yeah. The croupier, okay. Dealer. My, my, the, my, my Auntie Bertel, Alea Shalom, may I rest in peace, she loved to go to Atlantic City, oh, with all the Yidden, okay, and put nickels and uh, you the machines, okay. So croupier I learned from Auntie Bertel, okay. Dealer Av would be popular. Avram, do you know I'm going to Atlantic City to play the game? Okay, so go back. Have you been there recently? No, no, I haven't been there. No, Auntie Bertel <laughs> passed away, so I don't go there anymore. <laughs> we used to drive her there. It was so funny, I mean. It was really Larry David's show to take her there. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, um, uh, I'm a Palestinian in Ramallah. I see the, every Israeli prime minister coming here and both sides of the aisle applauding him time and again. How can I see this America as an as a, as a honest broker? I mean, it can't work. I don't trust it. So if you want to introduce America as an honest broker, respected by both sides, do something about the respectability of it. And this is not what Trump did. Is that, is that even possible in the next sure, three years? Sure, sure. Next three years with yeah. Trump as president or Pence? Trump president, I don't know. I mean, it's beyond my, uh, beyond my I mean, I, don't, I simply don't understand the personality. Okay, I mean, I take it that... I think you're not alone in that. Well, I belong to the popular vote, okay, but not to the majority of the, of the, co of the uh, electorate college, okay? I mean, I don't understand it. I understand populism. I understand the global, uh, uh, the global phenomena in which ta TV talents taking over politics. I, I, I see it. Do I really... Can you, can any one of us really substantiate a strategy about what we know about this president? Give me Steve Bannon. Promise me that Steve Bannon is, is four years in the White House. I know what to do. Really? Yeah. Brilliant guy. Have, have with a school of thought, with an ideology. I like it, I don't like it, but at least I have. And, an opponent which is not that whimsy. Okay, but now I have a candidate that tells me last week, whatever you Democrats and Republicans bring me, I'll take it because I respect this room so much. Okay, good. And then I go out of the room and, oh, where is the, where, what, what, did, what did you mean? Okay, and this is about Washingtonian affairs with his next door neighbor, Chuck Schumer, mm -hmm. which I take it in the past he gave some money to his campaign. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I don't know, I never checked it, but I speculate that this is what happens in, what happens in New York stays in New York, okay? <laughs> so about my region of the world, that he has no clue where is it? So what if Ivanka is a Lubavitcher? <laughs> That's not an argument. <laughs> so give me Steve Bannon, I know what to do. Give me Donald Trump, I'm lost. Okay, well, since you raised this question, 
would you prefer to have as your leader, whatever country you so choose, if it's a choice between a Bibi Netanyahu, who you know, and a Donald Trump, which to you do you prefer? Michelle Obama. That uh, wasn't one of the choices? The, <laughs> listen, listen. Uh, um, there is a beautiful, um, a be uh, fantastic podcast of Yasha Munk. He is a German origin guy, intellectual, who has a beautiful podcast. He, he fights back, uh, uh, he fights back um, Trump. Very interesting podcast. And in one of these, he, he has somebody, I don't remember who was it, who said, people in America in the last election, the 2016 elections, it is not about the charisma, it was not about the talent. When they had to choose between a leader with a lousy vision and a leader with no vision, they preferred the one Trump with a lousy vision over Hillary with no vision. So I will answer your question is, if it's Bibi Netanyahu or Trump, I prefer Bibi Netanyahu. That's a well-read person, has issues with personality. I'm not at all sure I would have married his wife if, if, even if it was compulsory in Israel, okay? I'm not at all sure, okay? But nonetheless, the individual, the individual is well-read, ideologically driven, and has a strategy. He doesn't want to relinquish the occupied territories. Not in my shift. That's an ideology. I don't like it, but I can confront it. Michael, do we have time to ask uh, for questions? You want me to ask them questions? Yeah, yes, you, uh, you ah. go ahead. Okay. Who wants to answer? Uh, <laughs> do you have a uh, mic microphone? Okay, a microphone's coming down here. Sorry for dominating it here. Coming around this end over here. Uh, uh, you, you talk about Gaza, you talk about West Bank. The uh, United States just cut back $85 million to the camp for the 2 million or so in the surrounding countries. What's the pressure then going to be with the three types of Gaza, West Bank, and then the diaspora for the Palestinians? What's, or is that too complicated? <laughs> no, no, it's what's your name? Stanley. Stanley, hi. This equation has two sides. What this isolationism means in general, I mean, threatening uh, uh, Ambassador Haley and threatens the UN, they're going, you're going to withdraw, going to withdraw from UNESCO, withdraw from uh, UNRWA. This entire neo-isolationism is a question about how the world looks with American self-made vacuums. I would like to speculate that the money will not be short to none of this. It will be provided by China, Russia, and maybe even the Iranians. There will be alternative sources of money to the American self-made void, which is so stupid, okay? Coming to the issue of the refugees, or the UNRWA, the, 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 the United Nations Agency for... <clears throat> I believe that better can be done for the Palestinian refugees. These hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, are being used as pawns by the Arab states, by Israel, by the West, by the Palestinian leadership much better could be done. I have no doubt about it, by all. Better policy, better agency, better this, better this, better this. The last way I would have started the improvement of the Palestinian sore refugee dilemma is by cutting the money. If you're an American president, if you're angry at the Palestinians and you cut the money, it's almost anti-Semites. It's as if to say, ah, oh, hit the Jew in his pocket. If I'm an American president from 
right-wing persuasion, and I would like to put a pressure on the Palestinian president, I would say, you know what, or even on the UN, I take upon myself the responsibility to improve the life of the Palestinian refugees. Not worsening it by removing the money, but moving differently. Improve, correct, restructure, repair, etc. But what can I expect from <coughs> presidency that does not care about 700,000 of its own citizens who are waiting for tonight at midnight to know whether they exist or not, and then they will defer it for March as if it is, well, two months for an individual. Yeah, well, he had a dream, which became a nightmare. So somebody is not sensitive to his fellow citizen or fellow American, what can I expect from him to be sensitive or to be uh, human or be mensch to somebody in Gaza? I have no expectations. But I know where the money will come from. Any other questions here? Um, can I ask you to ask me a question? Oh, well, actually, I want before. Okay, okay, but, good. Because I, I, I okay. The the, the 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 writing teacher in me just has to read something that you wrote because I do um, I do love the I did love this line. I'm a great believer in dispute as part of the act of creation. Indifferent or subservient people and lame or worn ideas do not fertilize or bring to life new worlds. Only debate is capable of giving birth to humanity and humanness. Uh, this is from my last book, right, in Days to Come. Um, I think so. No, this was in, um, the Holocaust book? The Holocaust book. Did I quote myself again? Yes. Um, <laughs> Oh, I think you gotta get you got you gotta you gotta get after yourself for plagiarism. L listen, listen. I I don't know if there is a God. I mean, I've never been behind the curtains, and I, I didn't get. I, I have no clue if there is a God, but I've no doubt. If God is Jewish, she created the world with polemics, and I'll explain it. Okay. If you agree with me. And I agree with you. And we're in consent with Michael. And we all agree with them. Life becomes so boring. Water is still. Nothing moves. Nothing is produced. Nothing, none whatsoever. But if we disagree, and we fight, and we sharpen our disagreement, and we, 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 we produce as much possible arguments, <coughs> this disagreement produces new synthesis, produces from your thesis and my antithesis, something new is born. So polemic is a locomotive, is an engine of creativity and creation. So I believe that the Jewish God, sh she created the world with polemics. It's in Judaism, by the way, now I'm serious, polemic is a tool of creation. Machloket, disagreement. It's a culture. So whenever I leave home, I'm always equipped with a second opinion. Because if, God forbid, I'll meet somebody who agrees with me, immediately I have a different set of opinions to disagree with him. <laughs> OK? Um, so let me disagree with you here. You, you do paint a rather bleak picture of the future. Um, another scholar, Steven Pinker. Apropos pink. What? Yeah, apropos pink. Yes, apropos yeah. pink. Um, seems to point out through all sorts of interesting scholarship and statistics that we are getting more peaceful, more civilized. Um, every, yeah. Less hunger. Less hunger. Long li longer life. Less health. rape. Less uh, slavery, apartheid. Less violence, more less democracies. Violence. So how do you reconcile that? with the sort of the world you've just painted for us the last 90 minutes? First, you simply ask the wrong kind of questions. Only did you ask me a different kind of a question, I would have given you a different world, OK? <laughs> but listen, the fact that there are cracks in the utopia does not necessarily mean that everything is cracked. OK, I want to improve, I want to correct, but look at me. 
I'm a Jew. I mean, inside, I, I like a sushi, inside out, outside in, I'm very Jewish. There is hardly any sentence of mine who ends without a question mark, okay? Except for that one. What? No. <laughs> uh, and I look at myself and I say, okay, I'm in dire strait, I'm a left winger, I'm an old goodnik, I'm not very popular. Thank God they buy my books because they don't like me so much, okay? Uh, because they want to, to know who am I. Okay, okay, okay. Only did you wake up my grand-grand-grandfather or mother of 200 years ago or 400 years ago and would have told them, listen, Grandpa, I'm living in the independent state of the Jews. Our GDP per capita is 30,000, annual $30,000. We have 200 denied bombs. 78% of the Jews, I mean, 98% of the Jews are living in the democratic hemisphere, which means 24,000 Jews are living in Iran, 4,000 Jews are living in Morocco, two Jews living in Afghanistan are not talking to each other, and the rest of the Jews are living in the democratic hemisphere. 78% are living in two demographic centers that were not even there when you were, were alive, Grandpa, in the state of Israel and the autonomous Jewish, and the Jewish autonomy of, the, of the North America. I take it that my grand-grandpa would have said, what happened, did the Messiah arrive already? <laughs> Not the Lubavitcher, I mean, yeah. the real Messiah? <laughs> I mean, from the point of view of all the past generations, I personally, and my children, and my children to come, are living in the best ever Jewish generation. I simply have to work harder that when 200 years down the road, they will wake me up. I hope they won't because I'll be asleep, okay? But when they will wake me up, their world will be even better than mine. That's it. I, you know, I probably should leave it at that, but you did say something that I, I, I just, you, I, I can't let go because I did mean to ask you. Um, you talked about the 200 denied bombs. You have been a speaker of the Knesset. Israel, just you tell us as a fact, Israel owns nuclear weapons, right? Sure. Of course. And yet the country still denies it. Yeah, but that's a solic. It's stuyot. It's uh, Come on. Come on. We had in Haifa four years ago, a conference that I organized with some friend of mine about Middle East without weapons of mass destruction. Now talk about a fantasy. No, no, I, we had a conference yeah. and it started. Listen, it was before Obama removed the chemical weapons from there and before Iran. I believe it's possible. I believe that's the only, equa the only equation for the future of the place. And I said, listen, usually we use the rhetoric we used to say is, Foreign sources are saying that Israel is having a nuclear capability. Let's cut the crap, okay? We have it. You've seen it. I didn't use it. Okay, no, but I know we have it. Everybody knows we have it, and you know we have it. I, I know you have it, but... So you, what's the problem? But, but, but wait. Do you know you have it because everyone knows we have it? Because or do you know it because when you were in government, you saw documents... You saw hardware that could tell us it exists. In other words, for a journalist like myself, there's a difference between secondhand and no, you saw it. In none of my previous uh, experiences, neither as a part trooper officer, nor as a member of Knesset in some of the most sensitive committees, not as a speaker of the house and whatever, I never had a responsibility over the, uh, over the, over the trigger. That's okay? not what I asked. No, I'm, I'm telling you. Yeah. Do I know for sure that we have it? The answer is yes. Am I the only one who knows it? No, because you know it as well. I, Secondary, first, come on, don't go with, into petty journalism with me. It's not petty. Okay. It a, is petty journalism. We have it. Have you seen it? 
No, of course not. Nobody saw it. I mean, but Vanunu? Nobody saw it. It's, it's, a, it's a state secret. That's why I'm telling you. So don't tell anybody, okay? <laughs> okay? But I wanted you to ask me a question, but you're not fair. You didn't ask me a question. Okay, what question am I supposed to ask you? Yeah. I wanted you to ask me, are you an optimist or a pessimist? I thought that's what our whole discussion has been No, but about. I want to tell you that I'm an optimist. Yeah, you're certainly an optimist. Yeah, but, and there are two people in the room, my beloved students up there, Wilson and uh, Paula, who heard it, so I apologize that you heard it once more. Um, we used to ask my mom, Mom, what are you? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? She said, what, me? Of course I'm an optimist. Today is much better than tomorrow. Now, <laughs> I, have, I have a slightly different kind of optimism, OK? I really believe that tomorrow will be a better day. And every day of my life, each of my previous tomorrows was better than my previous yesterdays. And I'll give you just one little example, OK? Just one little one. I told you that I have a new grandson. It's, um, it's the eighth in number, only one girl, which drives me crazy. But what can I do? I mean, I have no control over the uh, motivation whom to bring to the world. Um, four of these kids speak fluent Arabic. Fluent Arabic. They go to bilingual school, and one day, uh, it was first a kindergarten and then a school. Yuval, a year and a half ago, he was four and a half, five years old, came back, I was babysitting, and I said, Yuval, what happened to the kindergarten today? And he said, we had a birthday. I said, wow, that's great. Who celebrated birthday? He said, Muhammad had birthday today. I said, wow, that's great. What did you bring him as a present? He said, no, no, grandpa. It's not Muhammad who lives next door. It was Muhammad who passed away many, 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 many years ago. <laughs> now to think about my grandson, who is the grand-grandson of my father, a Holocaust survivor, and my mother, who was half of her family, was perished and slaughtered in Hebron, and half of it saved by Palestinians, reads and writes and speaks fluent Arabic, and celebrate as a Jew the birthday of the prophet. That's a different Israel. He is still a one. It's only four out of eight great ch grandchildren. We're not yet the majority. But underneath a new Israel is growing. It's a new Israel which is, which like here, when the pendulum will come back from arch nationalism, arch occupa occupa occupiers, arch militarism, these kids will be ready, unlike us who are not ready. And that's a better generation and a better tomorrow. I can't think of anything better to end that with. Um, so if you all join me in thanking our